All right, welcome everyone to our latest FX Canada webinar. Uh, as you can see, um, this is social media, a tool for the coaching toolbox. Um, my name is John LaFranco. I'm the coaching education manager at Athletics Canada. And today we have with us a, a very illustrious panel, as you can see. I was actually noticing that, um, you know, the, the bar is high to come on one of our webinars. You pretty much have to be a Canadian record holder now. Um, so sorry, Zach, I think we're going to have to just boot you out, but um, <laughs> no, we have a really interesting and, and, uh, and great, great people today. So before I introduce them, I just want to um, just go through a couple housekeeping things for you all. Um, you're all muted. Uh, we're on sort of the webinar format of Zoom, if you haven't been in that before. So if you have questions um, for our, our panelists, you can put them in the, uh, the Q&A box is a, you can, it's a box at the bottom where you can ask questions. And uh, Kyle, who's working in the background, will manage those for us and, uh, and we'll get them out to the panelists uh, as appropriate. We're going to probably do the audience questions closer to the end. And we'll do our best to get to all of them. Sometimes we get a lot and we can't, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, we are recording the webinar and it's going to be posted at the FX Canada website in the coaching section. You go to e-learning and then there's a tab for webinar. Uh, you go to coaching, I should say, and then e-learning and then there's a tab for webinars. And um, coaches who have entered their NCCP number in the registration will receive one PD point for their participation. That'll show up in the locker in a couple of days um, once uh, that gets entered manually. So our panelists. We have with us today, Tavia Charles, Col Charles Collins. She is a 2008 Olympian and she's the Canadian record holder, as mentioned, in the triple jump. Charles Collins holds a BA from the University of Miami and an MA in industrial relations and HR from the University of Toronto. Uh, she's coaching now, um, actively involved with Team Collins and uh, also is the owner of a clothing line, uh, which is called uh, Anissa. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Anissa. So plug that. Um, we also have Julianne Stolle, a Canadian distance runner who is the Canadian record holder in the indoor two mile, 922.66. Tavia's record is 14.02, only Canadian woman to go over 14, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so just so we get the numbers out there for people. Um, and Julianne was an assistant coach for Queens and Western University cross country programs. She has a master of uh, science in sports psychology and uh, is interested in safe sport education, in particular, the social media impacts, which is kind of why she's here today. So we also have Zach Jones. So Zach Jones is a not a Canadian record holder, uh, but, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, <laughs> someone stands out, it's okay. Um, but Zach is an NCCP certified performance uh, coach in endurance and currently coaches the Durham Dragons athletics uh, club or he's coaching that club a uh, great Ontario club um, he's worked with Paula Schnur at the McMaster cross-country and track team in the 2019 academic year as the team's social media coordinator while he was completing his master's degree in communications and new media um, and uh, he defended a dissertation on coach athlete relationships in the digital world um, which is again that's what we're talking about here today uh, he's currently completing his second master's degree at the University of Florida, studying sports management and high performance coaching. So two master's degrees, I guess no Canadian record, but that's still still pretty good. And um, awesome. I should say I wanted to plug. Uh, so the, the reason that I actually got in touch with Zach was because um, uh, he's doing that that master's and um, we we're talking about the advanced coaching diploma. So for those coaches who have done the performance coach and you're kind of like, what's the next thing the, the advanced coaching diploma um, is sort of that. And that's sort of how I met Zach. We we're talking about that. So um, we have a, a really, I would say uh, just illustrious and high powered panel here. So the way it's going to work is um, we're going to start with Zach. He's going to kind of present his research, um, talk about what he's, what he's done. And, um, and then um, we're going to just kind of move into a bit of a discussion on that. So we're going to use Zach's sort of uh, you know, research as, as a jumping off point for this. So um, yeah, so fire away, Zach. Mm -hmm. um, this works. 
Oh, there we go. Perfect. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction. Yeah, not a Canadian record holder. Um, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, so yeah, my uh, my master's paper dissertation that I wrote at the or at McMaster University uh, for the 2019 academic uh, year focused on social media and uh, the coach athlete relationship. Um, it kind of stemmed from the idea of looking at human interaction in social media and then being a coach, I kind of wanted to change the focus to how it could relate in a coaching context. So I'm gonna kind of give you guys 12 slides. It's, about, it's pretty much like the Sparks Notes um, version of kind of my research. Um, and yeah, we'll just jump into it. So the research, um, I did a content analysis of 40 different Instagram posts made by 21 different track and field coaches in North America at varying levels, uh, eSports, the NCAA, high school, club. Um, that was conducted. Um, there's a good chance some of the coaches that are on watching this right now um, probably actually helped me in my research. I used all public Instagram posts, so there is a chance I might have stumbled across one of yours. Um, from those 40 different Instagram posts, there were 238 athlete comments that were made, 195 of which were female. Um, if you notice anything kind of bolded as I go through the slides, that's kind of um, a little more in interesting information. Um, because as I learned as this paper went, paper went on, um, the gendered aspect was very interesting in comparing female to male um, athlete responses. So the research goals of this uh, paper were one, to understand how coaches use Instagram to further foster coach athlete relationships, understand how coaches represent themselves and their really relationships through Instagram. And finally, to understand how communication differs between female and male athletes in an online context, which wasn't actually, um, one of my main goals from the onset, but it became um, something really interesting once my findings kind of came through. So why is this re research important? Um, so most academic research and literature focuses on the negative aspects social media plays within the coach-athlete relationship. Um, this often includes sexual abuse, maltreatment, and harassment of athletes. Um, and social media continues to become more intertwined in our daily life. So as you know, just not athletics on Ontario or Athletics Canada continues to put safe sport measures in with kind of like, you know, social media. Um, many governing bodies, you know, across North America and the world are also doing that. Um, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of the times these governing bodies are like, just don't use social media, um, which is kind of hard to do because it's becoming more and more used, um, you know, with, I think, older coaches potentially and even like uh, younger athletes use it. Uh, very ubiquitous in today's world. Um, so what the research that tells us, so this graph right here just kind of represents the kind of general numbers. Um, so this data shows an overview of data in relation to gender and age demographics of the coaches Instagram posts analyzed. And this data suggests that female athletes are more likely to comment on their coaches posts compared to their male athletes. And what's interesting about this, this did not uh, what did not matter was the gender of the coach. So whether or not that coach was a male or a female, um, male athletes just didn't seem interested in commenting or communicating with them on Instagram. Uh, so male coaches received 42.1% of female athletes' comments, while 39.9% of female athletes' comments were made on female coaches' posts. So as you can see, there's not too much differing very variation uh, when it comes to female athletes commenting on either a male or female coach. Um, and then this was kind of more interesting was that the most male athlete comments made on a single post were four, where for female athlete comments made on a single post was 13. So right there, you can see that um, female athletes comment quite a bit more. Uh, continue, coaches under 30 received 33% more comments than coaches between 30 to 39 and coaches over 40. Male athletes, no matter the gender of their coach, are unlikely to communicate via Instagram, which is what I kind of talked about the last minute or so. Um, and, there are even and they are even less likely to respond to female coaches' posts. And historically, male athletes have had more negative attitudes toward female coaches. Um, that was from a 1985 study. I would like to think in the, you know, roughly the 30 years since, um, that's changed. I think we're seeing, you know, more female coaches at the helm of head coaching positions, um, but historically this has been something that's been around. 
What previous re research tells us is that there's no significant difference in internet, so internet or social media use by gender, but there are gender differences and motivations for time spent online, which is a really key draw from this research. So female users of social media, um, they use it more for social interaction, while male users use social media for more task-focused activities. Um, and females also prefer building and maintaining interpersonal relationships online. Um, where males focus on tasks rather than relationships. And I know I can speak to this kind of um, on a personal standpoint. When I started coaching, it was a lot easier for me to really make connection with like my female athletes and my male athletes. And it's something that I've really made a conscious effort of over the last couple of years to like, you know, really try to build those relationships with the guys team, um, even though it might be a little more difficult. So how coaches use Instagram to uh, further foster coach athlete relationships. So this kind of comes back to the beginning where I kind of had my three research questions for the paper. So in a really quick way to kind of go through that, they post meaningful content that directs that directly relates to their athletes. These include sentiment about the team or individual athletes and words such as proud, love, dedicated, and thank you are often used to express appreciation. Um, and when you combine all like kind of like the three bullet points above, this creates a mutual cohes cohesiveness and a sense of belonging within the relationship. Um, so how coaches represent themselves and their athlete relationships through Instagram. Um, it's usually as proud, passionate coaches with their athletes' interests and well-being of utmost importance. They portray their coach-athlete relationship in a much more mutual context in comparison to a relationship where there is a clear power um, or authority divide. And finally, coach athlete relationships that are most represented um, kind of a friendship were those in which the age gap between the two was smaller. So like, again, I can kind of use myself as this, I started coaching at 24. So like my grade 12 students or athletes were only been, I think like seven years younger than me. So that's quite a small age gap where, you know, at the university level, perhaps you can get a coach in their sixties coaching, you know, 18 to 22 year olds. So there's quite a large age gap right there. And finally, um, how communication differs between female and male athletes in an online context. I think this is something we're going to talk a little more as we open up the discussion. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, we know that female athletes use social media for different reasons than males. Gender norms and sport, to an extent, can explain this. So really quick touching on this. Um, one of the aspects I kind of looked into with this research was looking at hegemonic masculinity in sport, um, which essentially looks at um, how male athletes, for the most part, want to come off more tough, more machismo-like, um, which I think, at least in terms of social media and their ability or, like, how they don't use um, Instagram to communicate with their coaches might actually explain it. So even though track and field, for example, isn't considered a necess like necessarily a over-masculine sport, um, the idea of a male athlete showing emotion online or appreciation to their coach could seem um, perhaps weak. And combining gender uh, use differences and gender norms in sport does aid in answering this, which is what I kind of just talked about. So wrapping it up real quick, um, it's important to understand the differences social media platforms can play within the coach-athlete re relationship. I obviously uh, focused on Instagram um, when we had our little um chat with john last week um i think it's important that each of you like coaches that are going to use social media is it's important not to put social media under an umbrella instead of um it's important to make sure that you understand how different social media platforms are used like for example instagram is a pretty public um platform pretty much everybody that follows you or doesn't follow you depending on your um profile can see what you're posting compared to Snapchat, um, which actually causes most of the sexual abuse maltreatment of athletes. Um, as technology rapidly changes, so does social media use, and it's imperative that coaches understand and, um, understand and move forward, forward with this technology. I guess I had a little typo there. And social media, um, if used properly, can aid coaches in creating better group cohesion, foster the coach-athlete relationship, and increase athlete satisfaction and participation in sports. So that's kind of my little 12 slide spark notes on my research and I'll turn it back to John. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, lots of really interesting things in there. I think we've got a lot of different 
uh, areas we can we can jump on. I think, um, you know, kind of the, the the first one maybe that I wanted to get into is you know as as you alluded to the there are the governing bodies uh, of which you know I'm an employee and and which we all are all part really we're all members, um, but you know we're we're trying to figure out ways to to make sure that the sport is safe for everyone and social media is, is a part of that and we are you know kind of working on uh, you know setting up some rules and stuff but I think that research like this is really important because there isn't a lot of research and so what we what we have as policies now may change with research I think they should change with research so the more this kind of thing that happens the more we can kind of refine our our policies so I mean I guess the, the first thing and and I, the last thing about that story is that these policies tend to be negative. Like they tend to be, don't do this, don't do that. What we, we want to try to do here today is focus more on the positive. Like what are the good things that come out of social media? So I am definitely a, an old man coach uh, who is afraid of social media in terms of like, I, I don't really, I, it's not like, I, I just don't really know what to say. Like I, I, I don't necessarily communicate that way. Although you know, we, our club has like a, an app that we use that's like for training and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I just don't, as a person, sort of put things out in the public sphere. So as a coach, it would kind of be odd for me to do that. But um, I think that, you know, obviously there are coaches who do, and that's why you're here to talk about it and not, and not just listening to me. So maybe, um, maybe Tabe, we can start with you because you're Sort of, you know, actively coaching now, and yeah. and and how are you using this uh, social media generally, or maybe you know which ones you use specifically in a positive way? Yeah, for sure. So to be honest with you, I actually I love social media. I mean, there are negatives and positives with everything, but I feel like there are more positives with um, social media and Instagram than there are negative. Um, I put everything out there. I try to be as transparent. So one of like I feel what's important for me as a coach is that my athletes know that. I'm still human. I'm still a mom. I still have other avenues, but I'm a coach as well. And I love to use it because this is how I motivate my athletes. They love seeing themselves on Instagram. They love seeing them, you know, doing workouts and the encouraging captions that I use and, you know, talking about like how hard they work, how committed they are. And I feel like it's so important to reinforce that, especially with the generation that is always on social media. So I definitely take advantage of how social media impacts young people um, and I myself I am active very active on social media so many people reach out to me more more so on social media than texting or calling because you're there anyway they might come across a post and say hey let me send a message to coach Tabia um, let's talk about what happened today and you know sometimes I will say you know we can I can give you a call we can talk about it you know if you want to on over text or in person but that is always a starter where people approach me, um, where people say, you know, I found your page, somebody tagged you in something. So it opens up this whole world of just how I'm able to connect with so many new people, but also connect with my athletes. You know, it, there's something about these young kids getting a notification that they're tagged in a post and it's them doing amazing drills. And, you know, they're looking their best, they're walking over hurdles, they're, you know, they're sprinting, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and it does do something with their confidence. So. I definitely utilize social media. I think it's great for my fitness programs. You know, I'm with the Gazelles as well as Team Collins. And um, through that, people see what you're doing. You know, like people reach out and say, you know, I saw this team, a friend of mine sent me your, your page and sent me a video and a photo of you guys doing this workout. You know, what does this workout do? What are plyometrics? So a lot of my conversations are had, especially over Instagram. Um, and I love it and I, and I will continue to do it. And I know that Zach mentioned, yeah, there's a lot more negative, um, negative, um, things surrounding social media, but sexual abuse and harassment, those things can also happen in person. So whether you have social media or not, people are going to take advantage. It, it depends on the character. People are going to take advantage of athletes, whether it's in person, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on text message, whether it's, you know, there's so many avenues that people are, are taking advantage, which is unfortunate of athletes, but there's so many more positives um, about Instagram and Facebook and social media than there are negatives. I truly believe that. That's great. And you know, I wanted to just before I uh, asked Julianne, one thing that you mentioned there is, you know, you said talking about your workouts and everything's out in the open. And one of the one of the elements of safe sport policies is transparency. 
Yes. Right. It's, it's having things be out in the open. So in a sense, social media can contribute to transparency and, and, and have things be more out there. So that's, that's a, a huge positive. Julianne, what's your take? Cause you're, you know, you're a current athlete, obviously. So interacting with your coach, but also working with university athletes as a coach. So what, what are some positive things that you, uh, you do on social media? Yeah, I think Tavia brought up a lot of good points that I haven't even really thought about from a coaching standpoint, but it has become kind of the main form of communication for a lot of athletes. And depending on your demographic and the age group that you're working with, that usually tends to be how how athletes are kind of communicating and just um, staying in touch and, and updates and all that kind of stuff as well. So um, just thinking back to when I was in high school, Instagram wasn't a platform that I had. So it's changing rapidly. And when you think about kind of a university age group, um, the, the age range stays the same. So you're working with a, with similar kind of young adult between 18 to 22, 23. Um, but the technology is just outpacing how quickly the new platforms and, and new media and all that kind of stuff that's come out. So um, I guess from a personal standpoint, I, I try and think about it as more of a tool um, than a form of entertainment or, um, you know, something that you primarily spend time doing, although it seems like it's becoming more and more, especially during a pandemic, it's, it's kind of our primary um, way of connecting with people. And I hope that changes once things go back to some form of normal. Um, but I think that would be my biggest takeaway is for coaches, for athletes, using the social media platform as a tool. And I think if you're posting, if you're communicating, making sure that the it's purposeful in the sense that, you know, you're engaging with the sport being the kind of primary topic of discussion. Um, and then I think coming to the safe sport side of things, if you have that communication, as you mentioned, John, you can have a third party that's on that chat. So if for Zach with Durham Dragons, if you have a, a social media account, um, there's probably more than one person that has access to that. Great. Then there's someone else that's that's seeing that conversation. If you have a post and you make a comment, um, the public can see that. And I think that's really important. Um, no different than the rule of two, uh, having that kind of communication. Um, a phone call looks different, obviously, if you don't have someone else on the line. So right. it's, it's just something really important, I think, that making sure that the intention behind how you're using that social media matters. And to any young athletes, I would say just trying as best as you can to, to really see it as a tool and kind of keeping in touch and up to date, but not making it your primary form of entertainment or unfortunately right now, but social interaction, I think it can't replace what you do in person with people um, on a track. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it, so again, just bringing it back to the like you mentioned the rule of two and, and stuff and, and talking about it as a tool. And that's, that's another one of the elements is like that, you know, the communication between coach and athlete should be about the sport and yeah, you, you know, sure you develop relationships and stuff and you talk about other things, but I think the, the, and, and as you allude to right now, kind of all the social interaction is happening potentially in this online space. But when, you know, when you're at the track, you know, you chat about what you chat about, whatever, like the, the hockey team or the how the school's going and stuff like that but if the you know the online chats can be more focused that's a, a, another way of kind of you know identifying it as like this is a coaching tool so on that note i wanted to ask and maybe we can go to zach and, and kind of go around to to um julianne and tabby as well on this um because we've been talking about instagram and we did have a question from the audience about the the other platform so what are what are the different platforms what are their pros and cons zach why was your research focused on instagram um, and do you have any research that, you know, kind of connects to like Facebook, WhatsApp, Messenger, you mentioned uh, Snapchat being a potentially sort of dangerous yeah. one. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll come back to Instagram last. So I'll kind of touch on the other ones really briefly. So um, in terms of, so like in terms of my paper, like the literature review that I did for it, um, much of the maltreatment, se sexual abuse, et cetera, the, the negative connotations with, with social media came through Snapchat. And the big reason why Snapchat is often an issue is because, um, well, one, usernames, a coach or anybody, you know, trying to be act in a predatory potential way um, can hide behind a username and like not disclose their actual identity. The other thing with Snapchat, everything disappears. So like you, you send a photo to somebody, they open it, it disappears 10 seconds later. You send a message to them, they close it, it disappears. You can't get that back. Um, often enough too, within like kind of that previous 
research that I use during the literature review. Um, oftentimes when, like not that coaches should have athletes on Snapchat to begin with, but when they did, it started off most of the time, um, and these, these are actually most, mostly cases in the US, um, they start off innocent, but then they lead to um, like negative things down the road, right? So just because something starts off with good intentions doesn't mean bad intentions um, can arise from it. Um, the most interesting, I think, social media platform right now is probably TikTok. Um, I had no idea what it was going into my master's at Mac. And my first semester, I actually did a, like a, uh, one of my classes. I did a major research project on TikTok. Um, that's similar to Snapchat in the way that you could hide behind um, like kind of a different identity. Um, I think that might raise a little more red flags in terms of like coaches like follow their athletes on TikTok compared to Instagram because I find that younger age groups tend to post more, uh, I don't want to, this is probably not the greatest word, but more precarious things that they probably wouldn't post on Instagram. Um, Facebook, I find with gener younger generations, like I'm a 94, you can go back to like 98, 99, they don't really have Facebook, that's kind of dying out with um, kind of like the Gen Z, um, but then moving backwards to, or coming back to um, Instagram. I think Instagram is probably the best tool for coaches to use because one, it would be kind of pointless to hide behind a different identity. Um, and two, it's the most public um, social media platform kind of amongst the other, uh, the ones I've kind of talked about. Um, and it's a good way for like, you know, like I just don't have my athletes follow me. I've got a lot of parents that follow me too. So um, just, I guess, and it kind of comes back to that overall transparency. Um, I don't post anything on Instagram that I wouldn't be okay with every single person that could come across my profile scene, whether that be like other athletes, uh, my own parents, family, um, you know, potential, you know, uh, employers, et cetera. So I think Instagram kind of has those safeguards up unintentionally just because it is so public to begin with. Cool. Uh, Julianne, what, what if, what's your take on the different different platforms and how you've how you've used them? Yeah, well, I I guess I would have started out with Facebook. So that was kind of like grade seven to grade eight. And at first I was like, what on earth is this? You know, you have like friend friend profiles and everyone's making these random status posts. And now you get updates like 13 years later and you're like, oh my gosh, you know. But I think that was kind of the most personal because people were, you know, posting these albums from trips and all that kind of stuff. So now I look back on my Facebook and I try and keep that as kind of filtered as possible, or at least the, the friend groups kind of thing. I, I keep that more for personal use and just because it dates back so far, um, not that there's anything that I would not be comfortable, I guess, with the public seeing, but I just see it as more of kind of a, a personal use and just kind of a, I guess, a, a log that I can look back and, and see kind of posts and all that kind of stuff. But um, now I, I would say primarily Instagram and uh, Twitter would be kind of the main platforms. And Instagram is sort of that kind of one quick shot, you know, you're posting photos, quick caption um, stories, like it's, it's very kind of like clickbait and you're refreshing and there's new stuff coming up with ads, of course, always in between. Um, whereas Twitter, I see that more as kind of a news update report. And I, I would think it's sort of like your morning coffee routine, you know, you go through, you see what the latest update is, COVID status or something like that. And then I just try and shut it off and um, in terms of kind of the, the athlete side of it. And I think you, you curate these posts and I mean, you know, thought goes into kind of how you're, you know, presenting yourself as, as an athlete and, um, what you're showing and what you're not. And I think that's a big part too, that a lot of coaches and athletes, um, need to think about is, you know, how are you portraying yourself and you kind of decide how that looks and depending on how maybe a race goes or performance, but, I think the main takeaway is that you don't want it to interfere with, with what you're doing. And I've kind of seen it, especially Instagram as a way of kind of sharing my story alongside. And it's a special way of having people kind of support you. And maybe that wouldn't have seen that otherwise had you not posted. And depending on your following too, you can reach quite a few people in a very short amount of time, um, which can kind of be scary and not, but um, Zach made a good point that as long as the content you have is you're comfortable with everyone being able to see it and 
you know, going into kind of a teaching profession as well, I consider that and just make sure that, you know, it's something that I'm proud of. And um, no matter if it's a future employer, family, friends, um, that that's something I'm okay with. So uh, yeah, it, it is a great tool. I just think it really needs to be used in the best way uh, possible and just making sure that um, it's appropriate. Cool. Tabia, do you, do you have other, other accounts, other, uh, other platforms? What's your take on this one? Yeah, for sure. So I, I do have Facebook. I don't have Twitter, but I know Twitter is also very popular. Um, I do utilize, I have several different businesses. So I have different accounts um, for Instagram. I have my own personal, I have my fitness, I have a catering. There's so many different ones, um, but it's true. You know, you want to post with purpose, um, but I also do make it very clear. So I know sometimes it's, you know, we have our personal side, we have our business side and my personal page is my personal page. So um I always encourage athletes to follow my business pages um, um, and things like that, because as you mentioned uh, before, Julie's well, Zach is um, what you post, you want to feel comfortable with. And so what I post might be very different than what you post, Julie, or what you post, Zach. So I do always encourage kids and parents follow my business pages. Um, if I could block sometimes my, because my main page is, you know, it's my family. It is, um, I post things that are dear to me that are important. I'm very vocal about things that I am passionate about. So, and it may or may not uh, agree with others, but I do like to keep like my separate businesses very different because I still, I, I'm a true believer of being myself. Um, I'm a true believer of staying true to who I am. So although I might post my own personal opinions and I might post my own personal um, experiences and things like that, I also still like to keep my business separate as well, but um, they're both amazing tools. And if used well, um, used with you know proper intent, um, you can get a great reach and a, a positive reach. And you'd be surprised how many people you can influence in a positive way um, from your page. You know, so I am I'm a firm believer that it works very well. It's just we have to be smart. You know, I'm um, being smart, knowing who our audience is and. For me, it's a uh, transparency and being who you are is also very important. So um, that's also key in how you run your page. Great. Great. Yeah, that's really, really, I think a key, key message there of just like this kind of idea of being, I don't know, authentic. I don't like the word authentic. It sounds unauthentic, but but I think that's what it is, right? Just be yourself and, and being kind of, you know, having what you post be a true representation of yourself. So that leads nicely actually to my next question, which is how, how can coaches and athletes navigate, you know, there's some, some of the common social media issues, like, um, especially for young people, like how, you know, people would say, and I think this is somewhat accurate that it can promote sort of like a negative body image. Like you see celebrities and you're like, Oh my God, I have to look like that. Or even in the world of track, like, you know, it's, you know, not, I'm not saying you're doing the wrong thing, but Julianne posting your great result. And it's like, oh my God, look what Julianne did. Like how I can't be that good or whatever. Like, obviously that's not your intent, but how, how do you navigate that sort of that potential of, of the, the harm of social media? If people, and it's not really in your control, but that people get too into it or, or sort of see things in, in a negative way. Yeah, I would say, actually, I'm pretty guilty for that. Just focusing on the positive. And I think when I see other athletes that I look up to and I see that they're posting their bad days or the injuries or the setbacks or, you know, the performance that didn't go as planned, I really look to that. And I, that's where the authenticity comes through because when you, when you think about your career, there's nothing linear or just, you know, only positive results and performances. So I think a part of it is just for my own well-being is, you know, you post things and it's obviously, you know, you want to get the best shot or, you know, and it's a great race or the best performance and you put yourself in that light. Um, but when I do kind of think about what I appreciate and who I follow, it's the people that show both sides of that story. And I think for a lot of young athletes, realizing that, you know, the professional lifestyle or, you know, just, you know, being an athlete is, it's not just performances and you know great results and photos and all that kind of stuff so um it is it is important I guess but I think it's to your kind of discretion of how you want to represent yourself and I think Tabia brought that up too but maybe a personal profile versus um kind of public um I I just have one that I use but um it is something to consider because when you when you look at your audience you want to think you know how how might they perceive this 
And if they really want to, they can just go look at all the results and maybe some of the better performances that you've had as well. So um, it, it's a really good question. And I would say I'm not, I'm not an expert at that by any means. And I think first and foremost, you just have to make sure that um, you're comfortable with what you're posting. And um, if you can, making sure that, you know, it's um, going to be received, I guess, well, or, you know, that you're considering who your, who your followers are. Cool. Abby, I'll jump in. I'm ready to yeah, I know I love this topic because um, I so I do a lot of uh, mentoring and speaking. And so one of the biggest things that I touch on with young people is you have to take social media um, with a grain of salt, with a grain of salt and depending on who you're following, because although I believe that social media has all these positives, depending on like your mindset, your mind frame, your environment, um, your resilience to what you see in certain things. It is very easy, especially for young, even adults, right? But especially for young people to look and say, wow, like I want that person's body. And, you know, then you start questioning yourself, like, how do I look? And that is a big problem with social media. And it's not the fault of the poster. It's sometimes it's, you know, it depends the person that you are. Um, for me personally, I post my highs and I post my lows. You know, I talk a lot about how tough it was and how I was depressed when I got injured and couldn't redeem myself at the second Olympics. I'm very open about, about those things and about having different journeys. And, you know, as, as much as I love track and film, how amazing it was, there's other parts of my life that were also just as amazing. So it is very key. And I think, you know, um, as people, you know, as athletes and as influencers, it is so key to showcase the good and the bad. And many people don't want to do that because it opens up to judgment. And so for me, I know, Julianne, you mentioned, you know, how do people perceive things? And I'm a person like I could care less how certain people perceive things. Right. Because I am I my goal is that my audience, the people that know me, the people that are on like a similar journey, I speak to them so I can be my best self and I should be able to, you know, cry and talk about my lows and talk about my depressions or or sadness and people who are like me will get it. And it is very, I, I say all the time, transparency and authenticity is extremely important because there's so many young people, vulnerable people, vulnerable youth who are watching us and they wanna know that, okay, well, she's imperfect and she celebrates that. You know, after I had my baby, I didn't have like the amazing snap back and I didn't have a sexy flat stomach and I showed it, right? Because we're taught to hide those things because it doesn't fit into what it should look like on social media. But my goal is to portray that I am human. Um, and I want other young women, especially to know that all those other things, it's just that's social media. People put out their best, people put out their prettiest pictures, but it's okay to see the ugly. It's okay to see the bad. That's what makes us so unique and so different. And I believe that when young people realize that, oh, you know, well, it's okay. She thinks it's okay. And, you know, she's showing us that it's not all a bed of roses, then they can realize that the journey is, it's okay to have bumps in the road. And it's okay to not look like the next person. And I, I preach that as much as I can um, on all of my pages, um, on my stories. I'm very vocal about that. So I think it's our goal as athletes, influencers, to continue to have those conversations that imperfection is perfection, you know? So, mm -hmm. cool. Zach, was there any, did you come across any research on, on this just in terms of like how, you know, how athletes kind of perceive themselves and, and that in social media and some potential, I don't know, maybe there's some potential solutions in there. Yeah, um, I didn't really look at that specifically, but I can tell you just from a coaching standpoint, one of the, it's kind of one of the reasons too, like I hate my athletes being on Strava too, because you get into that whole comparison aspect of sport and like this is more of a distance runner thing going on to the Strava idea um but also it's like high school athletes are very good at creating um a following like quite a few of them can become like social media influencers and you see that a lot in the states and I will get um you know messages or like screenshots from some of my female athletes being like, they'll see like a workout that a girl in the States ran and they'll send it to me and they'll be like, can we do the same workout? And I look at it and I read through it. I'm like, absolutely not. We can't do the same workout. And then I like, you know, then I'll just like, you know, kind of do a quick little, like, look at this girl's like, 
profile and I see her PBs and I'm like, ladies, I'm like, her PBs are slower than yours. And she's running all her workout times at like paces that are telling her she should be running like, you know, with like university women. I'm like, so it's one of those kind of frustrating things for me because like they get so like excited. Like, oh my God, this girl in the States is like running this work. And I'm like, girls, I'm like, kind of just trust the process and trust me as your coach. I'm like, just because, you know, an athlete in the States or even another athlete in like the province are doing one thing doesn't mean that's necessarily the best course of action for you. Uh, so that's kind of something that I've come across in the past with my own athletes. And I kind of just be like, I'm like, it's all smoke and mirrors. I'm like, you know, you guys need to focus on you, pay attention with like your own workouts and not worry about what other athletes are doing. Yeah. The workout Wednesday is a bit of a, a bit of an issue sometimes because it's, you know, like, okay, we know that we're going to film this one. So we're just going to do like the biggest workout and then, but they don't post that like they got injured next week. So <laughs> that doesn't help at all. Yeah. Cool. That's, that's great. Great, great, great feedback on that one i think it's 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 so important just to be yeah just be open about it and and like realize that um as coaches and i mean you know like i said we do have this illustrious panel but coaches who maybe are not record holders or whatever can still have to see themselves as like role models and understand that you know the things that they do people are looking at you as a coach and so you you have to make sure that you're kind of aware of of that and, and yeah and just being you know, like you guys said, the good and the bad. So, um, so kind of on that note, like w- what are some, uh, read the question the way I posed it, I guess the do's and don'ts for coaches who want to use social media and their coaching. Um, so a couple maybe elements to this one would be on a kind of a recruiting side, like, um, you know, Tabby mentioned a lot of people reach out to her. Um, so how do you work the recruiting and then kind of on the same idea, um, in terms of posting workouts and things like that, like, do you have a process for permission? Like if you're showing, you know, an athlete doing a drill, like how do you make sure that the athlete and the athlete's parents are okay with that sort of stuff? So I, I feel like these are related. Maybe they're not. And you can pick one and answer one and not the other, but I don't know. Um, Tabby, maybe you want to start? Yep. So um, before I post anything, so like for any of my teams that I train, I always send out a media release form. So, you know, if someone's not comfortable, I would never put them online because people want to feel comfortable and confident. Um, So there's always a media release form to be reviewed um, and signed and sent back to me. And if people ever, you know, when they reach out to me on social media, doesn't get any questions or information, I always, um, I always direct them to my website and I always provide my email because of course, you know, I feel like the social media tool it's a good introduction. I don't want to be having like big conversations, you know, on social media, but I always direct them to my, the website as well to my email. I send out all information uh, via email. So there's always, you know, there's an email trail. Um, Nothing can be misconstrued, you know, over communication through the, you know, direct messaging. Um, But there's always that, let me direct you to our website, direct you over to our, our email. And then that way I have my administrators who can also see communications if I'm unable to. And just, it's just good for, it's good for both parties uh, to do everything through an email trail. Nice. Yeah. And so Julianne, you, you've worked with a couple university teams, which is, I think probably, you know, um, like a place where recruiting is, is kind of big. Um, and uh, I know I said before, I'm not on social media, but secret Instagram account actually I'm, Part of the Concordia University Instagram account, but I have uh, the captains are also, and they mostly do it. But so that's an example of how we're kind of, you know, there's multiple people on it. But so how, how would you, in, in a kind of a university setting, use social media to recruit for the programs you're working on? Um, I mean, I haven't done much recruiting myself. Usually, like when I was helping out with the teams, um, I was coming on in September, uh, meeting the athletes. And um, the only recruiting actually would have been a trip that I had made to OFSA back in 2017, 2018. And that was in in Kingston, actually. Um, So I've only really had that in-person experience. And then on the other side, being the athlete. But all I can say is being able to search a name and then seeing the face I think there's just such an ease of like that interaction because in high school I got letters sent to the office which were then delivered to the classroom and I'd be all proud because I'd have these you know university um, letters and I'd just be opening them up but 
now it's you go on your Facebook Messenger and then you can click on their profile and then you can go see their job description and away you go. I mean, you can do the research before you even talk to that person. So it's completely changing the landscape. So I can see from a coaching standpoint, um, you could send a hundred requests to multiple athletes in comparison to having that formal letter, um, which I mean, I loved receiving and I'm kind of old school in that way, but um, yeah, I can't, I can't speak too much to recruiting because I haven't done that so much, but um, it's just, it's, it's different. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And shout out to Kirk DeFazio who sent me a letter, even though I was only like 54th at OFSA. Thanks, Kirk. I, I didn't go to U of T, but, but he tried. So it's all good. But um, yeah, like I think for the athlete, that's good to know, right? It's, it actually puts the power back in the athlete's hands because you, you can follow that trail and like find out who the coach is and see that kind of that sort of social and internet kind of imprint. And, and I think that um, having one and having a positive one is a real kind of point of, of credibility. Um, you know, so it, it, it certainly helps versus the, the letter where you're just kind of like, oh, okay. Um, so Zach, you're on the high school side, mostly, I guess. Um, so what, what do you do? I mean, I don't know that, I'm not sure if, you know, a club like Durham Dragons is necessarily recruiting or if it's just more of like from the local area, but certainly your athletes are being recruited. So what's your take on, on, on this one? Yeah. So I, and I can kind of speak to this from the McMaster side of things as well from um, a year and a half ago. Um, so in terms of dragons, um, in terms of kind of getting our numbers up. So since I started coaching and obviously with the media background, I've really kind of made our Instagram and our social media, like much more active in the past, like two years. Um, and often we'll get like, I'll get a DM from like a kid or a parent or whatever. Like, hey, like whatever. And I'll just, and the same thing as Tabby does. I send the email, send my phone number. If parents want it. Um, I love I'm, I'm more of a, I'm, I think I'm even more old school that I like, you know, a phone call kind of that, you know, that then kind of playing email tag or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's definitely helped as a recruiting tool. Um, and then for senior athletes going off to universities, um, you know, a lot of like, I know with the McMaster social media, I follow a ton of clubs in the province. I know with our dragons, there's a lot of university teams that follow our Instagram accounts. So it's a really good way to kind of have everybody connected um and you know I think once or twice I've had a couple of universities reach out and be like hey, and like because they know I'm the coach like you know friends that I raced against during my undergrad that are now coaching at their former university and they, they'll reach out to the Dragons and be like hey Zach do you have any like senior athletes that you know might be interested in going to like so and so um so it's really, really cool in that regard um in terms of McMaster it's been really helpful the last year or so um, not sure if Paula's on the phone call or not, or like the Zoom today, but Paula um, is kind of really old school when it comes to that stuff. So a lot of the times um, I'm able to kind of facilitate some grade 12 students getting in touch with Paula. I'll get in, we'll get in um, like a direct message on the Mac account be like, hey, I emailed your coach and haven't heard back. And then I'll be like, oh, hey, no problem. Um, I'll get in touch with her for you. Um, kind of give a reminder and then hopefully you guys can connect that way. So it's a good meeting, like a good meeting point. Sometimes if um, prospective athletes for a university program can't get in touch with like the head coach there, they can reach out to like the social media aspect of it. And then like, um, you know, we've got our team captains that also have um, account access. So sometimes I'll see a message come in, I'll go to, I'll go to reply and it's already been replied to. I'm like, thanks, Andrew. Um, so yeah, things like that work really well. Um, but yeah, it can definitely be a fantastic tool in recruiting overall. That's great. Yeah, definitely. I, Paula, Paula signed up. I don't know if she's there right now, but, uh, sorry, Paula, we're calling you out here. It's okay. I, if I, if I want to talk to Paula, I use the phone. So I don't <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that's great stuff. I mean, I think that you know, it's just showing how, how there, there is a lot of positive potential, um, to it and, um, someone in, in the questions is just, well, it's not really a question, but they just sort of posted, I think, I don't know if this is actually the, the um, athletics uh, policy, but it's just a, a few points about, you know, avoid connecting with play. I think it can't be athletics as players, but players and parents through personal social media accounts, use a professional account. And I think you guys have all sort of mentioned that, that, you know, the team accounts with multiple people uh, who have access uh, and that sort of thing. And then like moving it through this sort of you know, administrative chain kind of thing, like our club, um, you know, we have a, a person who's in charge of, of registration in that, you know, and, and of, I mean, and this is a good thing, I think, overall for, um, for coaches and for just the sport and for clubs, because often, 
everything falls to the coach. And if, if we can collaborate more and have other you know, people involved in these administrative things, especially social media, where it's, you know, maybe some coaches aren't as, as uh, I don't know, comfortable with it. Um, it takes the, the, the workload down a bit and, and it, you know, it spreads it out and it has the bonus of being the sort of safe, uh, safer kind of procedure. So um, that's great. So I, the next question I wanted to ask was about just some examples maybe of how, if you can, I mean, I don't need to name names or whatever, obviously, but if it, social media has brought you closer with, with athletes you coach or, or as an athlete with, with your coach, what are some examples of, of kind of things that maybe, you know, happened via social media that couldn't have really happened otherwise? You want me to start with that, I guess? <laughs> uh, uh, sure, go ahead, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so um, I think right now it's super important with the pandemic going on, really having limited, you know, face-to-face -face like um, conversations with athletes. You know, we've been on and off, small groups, bigger groups, totally locked down. Um, so social media still gives me a way to communicate and connect with my athletes, um, especially since I might not be able to see them too often. And then even when I was away at McMaster, I had only been coaching for eight months and I decided to go back to school. Um, and social media, again, was one of those ways to kind of keep stay up to date on how the kids that I was coaching were doing. Um, kind of came to a point in September and October that like Monday and Wednesday nights, I could pretty much put, you know, 6.30 to 8 o'clock aside because my phone would just be blowing up with like other phone calls, messages about like how the workouts went because the kids just wanted to let me know how they were doing and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been, for me, it's been nothing um, but a positive experience so far. Um, I hope that continues. And like I said, from my little like spark notes slideshow, um, from day one, it's been a lot easier for me to kind of build those relationships with the female athletes. And since that first year of coaching, I've really made a more conscious effort of trying to connect better with uh, the male athletes and the boys that I've been coaching. Um, and that's something that I've just learned over the last year. That's something that um, I learned, obviously, through writing this uh, research paper. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I think social media is a great tool. I think coaches just need to be careful, know um, where that boundary is in terms of not crossing it um, in terms of, you know, what this, what the discussions are, like 99.9% .9 of all my discussions are, they're so track and field related. It's like, I'll get a message, oh, my foot's hurting. <laughs> or like, oh, this workout went really well. Um, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I'll pass that on to another Julianne or Tavia. Um, yeah, I, I would add, um, so the good thing about, I mean, social media that you couldn't do before is just getting an idea of even just ideas of what other people are doing. So even as a jumper, just like learning new plyometric um, exercises. I feel like sometimes coaches just want to do their own thing, but nothing's more beautiful than learning from others, like getting new ideas. Oh, I've never seen that before. You know, that's new. Um, another important thing is for athletes to stay motivated. So a lot of, you know, as mentioned, the young people, the youth, they follow a lot of people on social media. And even during the pandemic, you will see people by themselves doing their workouts on their streets and taping it. And it kind of continues to motivate athletes that even during the pandemic, you cannot stop and you gotta stay committed. You gotta have perseverance even through this time because it's only a temporary time. I mean, sometimes we don't see the end, but the end is gonna be, is, is neat. you know, it's coming. Like it's gonna, this is gonna be over and you've gotta go right back into the swing of things. So. If you can, you know, be able to watch other athletes, seeing them still working out because we're all having a hard time, right? But it's, it's how you are going to get through this time as an athlete. How are you going to remain true to yourself? How are you going to remain committed? And so when they can see other people doing that, it's motivating. And so I can appreciate um, that part of it. Yeah, this is all great things that have been said. Um, I would say, I guess, from the athlete standpoint, um, for, you know, inspiration or motivation, I think it, it can be a really great tool. Um, but just really coming back to that piece of making sure that um, you're taking it with a grain of salt. And I think the comparison piece that came up is really important to consider. And when you have impressionable athletes, and especially high school, kind of first year university, um, I didn't have that kind of additional pressure of that social media and how things were so quickly, um, you know, disseminated <laughs> among the, the general population. But 
I think just educating athletes in terms of, you know, how that can be used effectively. And for myself, things that really matter, um, I use email and iPhone or preferably in person. Um, So most of my communication, I would say, um, if it's something that I can write up in in a paragraph, absolutely, I'll send that off. If it's a discussion that I want to have that's, you know, maybe more in depth, I think a phone call is so much more effective. Um, So again, I just, it's really using things to their kind of capacity or their you know, making the most of whatever that platform is. Um, But just coming back to the, you know, looking at it as just one other way of of communicating, um, but that it shouldn't be this sort of be all end all um, and that it it will never replace kind of in person and having kind of that coach athlete dynamic. Cool. So um, the question here that kind of it kind of comes with uh, another question from uh, Robert Esme, big name. Thank you for your question, Robert Esme, Olympian, gold medalist, um, last off, right? Um, so what, what are, this is my question was, what are expectations of professionalism that athletes can have, should have from coaches in terms of the social medias? And Robert turns it around and says, well, what, you know, are athletes understanding that they have, in, that what they post can have impact as well. Like in, in the US, you can lose a scholarship for, for certain things and stuff like that. So do, you know, what, let's talk, I mean, we wanted to keep it positive and everything, but like, what are some of the kind of, you know, professional responsibilities and boundaries and Zach alluded to the line? Like, can we, can we kind of lay that out a bit so that, that it's, it's clear from India? Yeah. Um, something I've always kind of said to my athletes, I'm like, um, you know, make good decisions as basic and as simple as that is. That's something that I've always kind of tried to get across to them is about making good decisions, whether that's posting online, what you're doing um, to your, you know, in your day-to-day life. And I always kind of bring it back to think before you do and before you post something, before you act in a certain way, something like that, you know, it, it only takes 10 seconds to ask yourself, you know, would my coach be okay seeing this? Would my parents be okay seeing this? Would a teacher be okay seeing this? Cause you know, there's so much peer pressure um, with like high school age athletes and stuff to, you know, kind of follow the trend of what their friends are doing. Um, and there are consequences for that. Um, I can't think of any specific, um, any specific uh, like, I guess, things that have actually happened to where an athlete has posted prior to getting a scholarship where it's been like taken away from university. Um, I'm sure it's probably more prevalent in the U S than up here, but yeah, I think overall coaches need to be careful what they post. Athletes need to be uh, careful about what they post too. Cause like, you know, on the coaches end of things, you know, our jobs are at stake. Um, our reputation is at stake and on the athlete and the thing, their reputation is also at stake, but potentially scholarship money and the opportunity to compete in sport is also at stake. Cool. Jillian, what do you think? What's, what's your line? I mean, you've expressed it a, a couple of times to be kind of. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, and I don't want to sound negative towards social media and, and everything, because there are so many positives. And I think even just in this conversation, there's things that I haven't thought about from a coaching standpoint that, you know, it's, and again, with COVID, like, where would we be without this? Um, But I do think, um, and I've just heard this from friends and thinking about back to when we were, you know, in that age group of grade 12 or, you know, heading off to university, if we would have had that social media, that just that kind of presence and accessibility to, you know, everyone's lives in some sort of way, I think it would have been another pressure. And I don't know how I would have handled that, you know, five years, 10 years younger than where I am right now. So I just try and consider that too, is the maturity of the athlete. And then, you know, sometimes it seems like, you know, the, the influencers and the people that they're following, you know, it, it can be positive for sure, but I think there is a lot of negative stuff out there as well. And um, the things that are becoming more mainstream and acceptable, it's, it's not what it was like, you know, even a few years ago, like just in terms of that posting and again, some positive, but I think sometimes a lot of it can be um, detrimental. So Again, I think Zach made the great point, but yeah, make good decisions. And with the coach athlete piece is if it's in the best interest of the athlete, if you're having that discussion, if you're posting something, if it's, if it's for the athlete, I think you can always justify something if, you know, if it's their betterment, but if it's, you know, if you're questioning whether or not it's maybe too personal or, you know, you're crossing lines, or if it's something that's not actually contributing to, 
to a positive um, discussion or whatever it is, I think then you need to determine, you know, should I post that or not? So, um, but yeah, it, it's tricky. And I think it's, you know, again, we're in a pandemic. So what would it look like without is, is a really good question. Yeah, that's great. No, I think it's just important to recognize that it's not obvious. It's, it's, you have to that make good decisions is a very subjective, but important line to draw. So Tabia, what do you, what do you say? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everybody. It's such great points. And you make a good point. It's make a good decision is everyone's decisions are so different. What we think is good. But um, I think uh, one thing that coaches should also be very careful, like how you comment and respond back and something doesn't feel right. Or yeah, if it feels like it's too personal. Um, yeah, be careful how you comment. I mean, it's great to post and get everybody interactive and engaged. Um, but uh, it's the, the mindful piece is how do you respond um, in those comments um, especially to young people or to your athletes. Uh, another good thing that Julian mentioned is, yeah, there's so many positives, but there are some negatives. And it's so hard because you can't really control social media. I think one of the most important pieces that we should start doing is, whether it's in schools, whether it's you know part of your coaching program, is um, the piece of counseling and life coaching and making your athletes and young people understand that social media is sometimes it's very one-sided. And to take it as a grain of salt. And as much as you want to follow and take someone's word for gold, it's only a portion of the truth. And it's so important that we need to kind of help our young people um, create resilience and be strong-minded to pick sense from nonsense because you can't control social media. You can't control what people are posting. Um, but what we can try and do is teach young people and give them the guidance that okay, guys, like this isn't all real. Um, take it for what it is. Take little bits and pieces because what happens is people are taking things, you know, at, for gold, for, for guarantee. And this is where kind of like the self-esteem issues come into play. I try and mentor my young people. And, you know, I always end off with whether it's my soccer girls or my athletes as guys, you know, like, what's happening in, in, in high school and what's happening on social media is not the end all and be all, you know, like I try to tell them how important it is to be themselves and, you know, to be strong willed and be strong minded because I want them to know that what they see on there is not, because if you take it for truth, you know, that's when the problems start happening with, you know, the, the self-esteem and the low confidence. Um, but I think, yeah, let's try and empower young people that it's good to have a mind of your own. Um, take, little bits and pieces and don't take it all as a whole yeah that's great that's great so maybe to end on a, on a more uh, positive note because we're right at five and you know we said it's an hour and we don't want to keep people uh, too much longer even though the discussion is great and, and I think we could go on but just in terms of what I, I want each panelist to maybe give me one or two points on what are the elements of a good coach athlete relationship and how social media can impact that positively. Jillian, you start. Oh no, Tabia, you start. You're ready. You're ready. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already unmuted. Um, I feel it. like a great uh, coach athlete relationship is um, transparency. I'm big on transparency. Um, transparency, honesty, um, and of course having boundaries. So on both sides, like you know, for both coaches and for athletes, um, keeping that relationship as professional as possible, but also letting your athletes know that if they do need support, they can come to you, um, they can speak with you and you will kind of help them find certain tools and resources that can help that, whether that be counseling or whether that be, you know, other a nutritionist, um, things like that. So I, but I feel like open communication is huge and including the parents in those conversations. Any conversations that I have with any of my young athletes, um, I try and let the parents know as well. I talk to them and say, hey, you know, your, your, your son may be going through this, or I've talked to them about this, or I sometimes I even show conversations, right? I, um, just so I can make sure that it's all open and the parents know what's going on um, and there's no secrets or anything like that. Awesome. Julianne? Um, I think the only thing I'd add to that is just kind of a mutual respect. Like when I think about a coach athlete relationship is um, the athlete respects their coach and like vice versa. 
Um, and then the social media piece into that, I think it's it's using it to to what makes sense in terms of your situation. Like John, you mentioned that it's not something that you particularly enjoy, or maybe you just use it as a way of just kind of keeping up to date or, you know, you see your athletes post, but you don't really respond to that. And I think that's totally fine. Um, and they know what to expect, I guess. They're not going to be messaging you on Instagram because maybe you're not even looking at that platform. Um, sort of unrelated, but my only piece of advice for, for people who do have accounts, I was just thinking about that. Um, but if you, you know, if it's not a platform you use, then maybe don't have it. I think sometimes people get frustrated because they'll, they'll email or their text or they'll, they'll send a, a message and it doesn't, there's no response because it's just not an active account or something like that. So if anything, maybe just make sure that um, whatever you do yeah. have is accessible because there's nothing worse than, you know, if you're trying to have that con contact and um, you don't get a response back. So. Yeah, apologies to, uh, Alex here and Evan Dunphy, who both messaged me on Twitter in December, and I responded to them like a couple weeks ago. So maybe I should sort that out. Anyway, Zach, you, you've got the last word. What can you tell us, uh, coach athlete relationship and social media? Yeah, so I think three words I would use um, would be cohesiveness, openness, and trust. Um, you know, my entire paper, the word cohesive was constantly thrown around. I think that is um, so important to have within a coach athlete relationship. Um, I'm going to use this one quote from my paper real quick. Um, and it says, so coaches that create relationships that are more friendly with an even power to buy, meaning the coach needs the athlete just as much as the athlete needs the coach, are able to create relationships that are holistic, that emphasis positive growth and development. And I think that kind of overall sums up what we're trying to do as coaches. Um, I love the word trust in terms of coach-athlete relationships. I've always tried to view coaching um, or me as a coach, I'm in a position of trust. I'm not in a position of authority or power. I think trust is a much more important aspect to that. Um, and like how Tabia mentioned, you know, we're there to coach kids and make them great athletes, but we're also there to, you know, kind of help them walk through life in their teenage years. And we're trying to make them be great people on the other end when we're done coaching them. So I think, um, yeah, I'll just leave it with that. Well, that's great. Thank you all, Julianne, Tavia, and Zach. I think, you know, all, all of the athletes that you coach are, are so lucky to have you and social media or not. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's, that's the end of it is, is um, you know, being a good coach, um, I think, you, you know, means you need to be a good, good person and your social media is going to be an extension of that. Um, so that's it. So thank you all. Thanks everybody. Sorry. I think there might've been a couple questions we didn't get to, um, but, uh, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll send them to the, the panelists, uh, who were involved and maybe they can send a, a response uh, through email or something, but thanks again. Um, looking forward to, uh, chatting more with you guys and, uh, to our next webinar, which will be, um, look for it. We don't know what it's going to be yet next month. Uh, hopefully we'll get something out there for you. We can keep doing this. So thanks everyone. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.